Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ceph, the Linux of Storage Today, brought to you by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. I'm Erin Farr, your moderator for today's discussion. I work for IBM, and I serve as vice chair of SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. And today we have two excellent speakers. We have Tushar Gahat, Senior Principal Engineer in Storage Software Architecture at Intel. Hello, Tushar. How are you? Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. And we have Vincent Zhu, Vice President, IBM Fellow, and CTO for Storage and Software Defined Infrastructure at IBM. How are you today, Vincent? Very good. Thank you. Thanks. So first, a little bit about SNEA. SNEA is an industry organization that develops global standards and de delivers education on all technologies related to data. SNEA is comprised of 200 industry-leading organizations, 2,500 active contributing members, and 50,000 participating IT end users and technologists worldwide. The SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative, or CSTI, is an active group uh, within SNEA that helps advance standards related to the cloud. We provide vendor neutral, vendor neutral education like this webinar on all technologies related to cloud. And so some logistics for today, you can ask questions during the presentation by selecting the ask question option and entering your question. And the slides are available at the attachment tab at the bottom of your console. Uh, but before we get started, let's take a quick look at the SNEA legal notice. This provides SNEA's copyright notice regarding use of the material. SNEA is not providing any legal advice and there are no warranties expressed or implied. So if you want to reference this material, please do so at your own risk. So uh, welcome everybody to today's session on Ceph, the Linux of storage today. And today we'll discuss the evolution of the data center and Ceph as primary storage. We'll talk about its consumability, its resiliency and security. And then we'll cover Crimson, the next generation Ceph OSD. And finally, since you can't have a talk these days without touching on AI, we'll, all, we'll also cover storage for AI. And with that, I'll turn it over to Vincent. Why, thank you, Aaron. Um, first of all, I'd like to start this conversation with talking about where we see the evolution of data center. And that's where we gonna we will articulate the case that why Ceph, the our vision is a Linux a, a Linux for the storage. So, if you look at the the data the data center evolution, right? Initially, that I think everybody is familiar with this the traditional on-prem data center. With uh, this is where people are kind of familiar with uh, you know decades ago that the things are somewhat kind of static. You know, most of the customer has a has a be able to predict their data growth really easily, I mean, more predictably, more consistently. And uh, there are a lot of fiber channel uh, dominance in those data centers. And But for the last decade or so, you see a lot of things called shadow ITs, that people start to move their data uh, officially or unofficially, unofficially go to the cloud, the leveraging the cloud technologies. Why is that? Because the agilities, the key thing is agilities. People need to something spin up very quickly, spin down something very quickly, instead of just go through the entire acquisition process. The cloud provides such a such a great environment for people to do that. And that's where is that's where you know the the public cloud offer all this wonderful uh, capabilities to allow people to be able to elastically scale their storage up and down. But after a while, there are lots of reasons people find out that well, public cloud is not exactly very cheap. Secondly, there are a lot of regulations that you really shouldn't move your data to public cloud, okay, for compliance reasons, for security reasons. Then people doesn't want to go back to the days worse, especially that nowadays, you know, a couple of decades later, that we, our, our ability to predict the data growth is not increasing. In fact, that there are so many new applications coming up, so many sort of new architectures, microservice architectures that we need to have something that's similar to the public cloud to be able to support this elastic workloads, elastic infrastructure, not workloads, sorry, that be able to scale very quickly, just like people can consume this storage, uh, like they consume the storage in public cloud. And that's where this concept called that uh, cloud native architecture on premise that has a, almost the same attributes and characteristics like public cloud, but has the same uh, has the same elasticities, but is sitting in your on-prem uh, data centers. 
okay, with all the compliance security capability. So with that, that uh, that's where we found the first, we found the, the, the gravity that, you know, uh, the, the CEF is you know, the best suited for this application, this environment, that CEF being a unified SDS or primary storage is really good candidate for the, this cloud native on-prem storage. First of all, Ceph has a base, you know, foundation Ceph is called Rados, right? It's across the same system consistent architecture between block files and objects and has a very, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, investments to focus on the block story, which is RBDs, the object storage, RGW, and file storage called CephFS. So let's talk about the block storage first. Traditionally, Ceph is very good at open, open stack and open shift. But community now, this year, is delivering the NVMe over Fabric, specifically addressing the VMware. Again, when we talk about this cloud native on-prem architecture, we have to address the big elephant in the rooms, which is the VMware use cases. So this is why, this is why the community is investing in this NVMe over TCPs and then supporting the VMware environment. Object storage, Ceph has the, be Ceph has the best S3 fidelity for the uh, object storage capability, it has a, a scalabilities and durabilities. We have customers that uh, uh, in the market that from various different vendors using Ceph, you know, using, I think the uh, total in the market is over several exabytes data using object storage on Ceph. And then CephFS, in addition to the file systems, we also, native file system, we also support, we also support NFS and Ceph uh, support as well. So you see, this is the basic foundation supporting the cloud native architecture. So you get a question? So yes, Vincent, I just wanted to interrupt quickly. I'm getting some, uh, at least one feedback of some folks can only see uh, the, only have the audio and are not seeing the video. I don't know if others can, uh, you know, through the question interface, let me know if they're also having that problem, please. Um, let's see if it's isolated. Um, and in, I guess in the meanwhile, I'll continue. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. I will keep talking. How is, uh, again, for this audience, I need to be more descriptive, I guess. So let's look at the cloud storage architectures, cloud consumability from consumability perspective side, right? The, in order to address this, you know, cloud-like storage on plans, that there are three major elements. Number one is consumability. We need to make sure that this storage consumes like cloud. And I think that there are a lot of material today. I want to go through this very quickly, and I'm more than happy to set up a separate deep dive on, deep dive on any of those technology. Today, I want to go just go over the highlight or recent function that Ceph is announcing in the, this year. Uh, the second one is the resilient security. So the third one is the performance, which we have a Tushar talk about that specifically. So let's talk about the consumability first. So I would say there are several areas. Number one is the setup, right? You know, I'm, I'm hearing people are uh, doing the keyboard things. Okay, sorry. So um, um, the setup, you think about it today in the cloud storage context. You don't really need to spend a lot of time to set up the cloud, so you're just using it. So. The first thing that was Ceph tried to address is make the setup as easy as possible. Ceph really runs the Linux containers and doesn't have any uh, restriction on particular hardware. So it's very easy for people to uh, set up the you know, Ceph clusters and they have a single command to guide you through the installing process, install process. Secondly, is the centralized management. There are two major character, uh, two major uh, technology there. One is called Ceph ADMs, which is a uh, utility deploy and manage the Ceph clusters. It's tightly integrated with the CLI command and dashboard. And the right hand side, the dashboard, which is the second unique, uh, very important technology, which is the, the new UI to allow our uh, Ceph user to be able to see the overall dashboard overview of the uh, their the state of the clusters. Then easy application integration. I want to let you know that Ceph has to spend a lot of time to integrate it with the higher level applications, such as you know the the, the Sparks and the Presto, the Trinos, and all this application integration to allow Ceph to be able to optimize for those applications in the enterprise data center. 
the easy upgrades. This is, you know, in a, if you are familiar with the, the traditional data center, if you will, the upgrades are always a headache. Every time you upgrade uh, different versions, a different different firmware version, different software version, different hardware, if you will, there's always downtime. And, you know, these days people really cannot schedule downtime, if you will, that, you know, there's the, the operations always expecting the 24 by seven. The good thing about Ceph is, you know, there's the multi-node scale architectures. There's no downtime. You can scale, you can, you can upgrade, upgrade, update, you know, no one at a time and the state of the cluster will maintain operational. Um, Last one is easy scalability. This is where probably the, the most pronounced uh, technology that people can see from uh, Ceph technology. It's just very easy to scale. There's almost no limitation of the, I mean, in theory on paper, there's no limitation. You can scale the performance, scale the capacities. And every time you scale, the things will be homogeneous, the linear scaling, which is a very, very important, try to build a backbone infra storage infrastructure for a cloud-like architectures on-premise. Now, I want to spend some time to talk about resiliency and security, which is another important element as a storage teams. So I only got to talk about the things that, you know, again, we announced in, in, in recent years that, first of all, this is called STS uh, security token services. So in order to play, in order to serve as a uh, storage substrate, the foundations, for the for the cloud architectures, obviously you need to support multi-tenant. You need to support uh, multi multi users, and you know different users have a different role and things like this. So we have implemented this called security uh, token services to so allow the client to be able to request the temporary, the limited, the privileged credentials, so they can perform the particular functions. So we once we have this one that had limited, you know, uh, privileged credential to allow. Uh, the user to process, uh, uh, perform a certain task, and it'll be easy to be able to reinstate that or reauthenticate that as well. Next one is IAM roles, bucket, and policies. So um, this one is be able to do the identity access management on you know on the on the buck on the on the bucket level. So instead of you share the same S3 uh, password across uh, multiple multiple users. That we can we can do this on a much more fine grained uh, role based control. The last one is encryptions. Okay, in the enterprise data centers, everybody need to encrypt their data to make sure their data uh, is protected by this kind of technologies. So we now uh, offer this ability to be encrypted on the objects before storing disk, and uh, and we can implement this encryption on uh, cluster wise or at rest or use and manage the inline object encryption. So it's a very flexible capability here. So I don't expect that, I didn't apologize, I did not go down to the uh, detail of each technology. What I'm trying to talk about is, in as Ceph is, has a, you know, the ingredients to serve this as a Linux for the uh, storage, to provide this new foundation for the uh, cloud native uh, uh, storage layers. Uh, there are three key components we are addressing. One is the consumability. I just showed you that a lot of new technology we are introducing as a community member. We are introducing those consumability to allow people to be able to consume stuff easily, just like cloud-like kind of consumer, uh, a process. The second one is the security and resiliency. We provide the encryptions, role-based management, and, and uh, STS uh, integration to allow people to be able to fine-grained control their assets and then the encryption of the data. Next, that Tushar is going to talk to you about how do we, in a lot of people talk about, is this, is this, uh, what's the performance that look like? What's the, can this, can this uh, technology support the, the demand of the, uh, the performance demands in the data centers? With that, I turn it to Tushar. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, <clears throat> I think after Vincent covered the excellent coverage of uh, you know, Ceph's expanding reach, uh, uh, performance is 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 is, is the uh, the next important topic. So in that context, I'm going to give you a high level on a project that Ceph community has been at work for the last two Ceph releases. Uh, it's called Crimson, 
which aims to rethink the Ceph OSD uh, in the support of new generation platforms and high performance workloads. So it should not be a news to anyone on this forum that storage hardware is improving at a rap rapid clip. Higher IOPS, uh, no, lower latency, every release. CPU throughput, though, it has not improved at the same clip. So we see a, a healthy exponential increase in core counts, but not so much in throughput per CPU. So IO processing budgets in terms of CPU cycles have changed quite a bit. Right. So, for instance, on a modern CPU that's clocked at uh, at or over two gigahertz, one can afford to spend only a few thousand cycles per I/O on latest generation NVMe devices. Whereas, when hard drives was the norm, the budget uh, for CPU cycles was generous tens of millions of cycles per I/O. So, if we want to extract the best benefit out of the fast storage devices like the NVMe SSDs. Um, for cost-effective reasons, we need to be highly parallel and need to be highly efficient in terms of clients for IO. Now, Ceph uh, came about in the age when we could afford uh, you know, many more cycles per IO, so rethinking has been necessary. So to this end, the Ceph community kicked off a pro the Crimson project around the Pacific release, uh, about the time when the price per terabyte of you know the NVMe SSD started to be within the reasonable distance of hard drives. So let's look at the challenge the the classic Ceph OST has. The classic OST relies on thread pools and shared queues for communication between various components of the Ceph data pipeline. So while the synchronous read, or sorry, the synchronous thread and I/O models were good enough. In the past, in a multi-core environment, synchronous I/O and reliance on thread pools to handle different portions of I/O incurs significant latency, and this is because of cross-core communication that's required. So even if the workload is allowed to scale to multiple CPUs by adding more threads into a pool, uh, with these threads sharing resources, they need locking, and the overhead increases rapidly with the number of cores. So one metric we can look at uh, to guide this discussion is the CPU utilization for the OST. Uh, so this is these are charts from Mark Nelson's analysis uh, of this classic Ceph OST. Uh, as you can see in the charts, the core utilization numbers are for the OST are quite low. So so essentially, when you compare the the blue and the red lines uh, with the with the gray line, right, which, which indicates the core allocated per OST. Uh, the the utilization is is roughly in the 25 to 50 range, uh, even for a, for a large cluster. So reducing these costs, maximizing cycles per I/O, minimizing context switches, uh, as well as minimizing memory copy operations, is the primary goal of the Crimson project. So the basic principles <clears throat> in Crimson are one thread per CPU, non-blocking I/O, and user space scheduling. So requests as well as associated resources are sharded by cores, so they can be processed on the same CPU core until completion. So that's the run-to-completion model. Locks and context switches are thus minimized, and each non-blocking task owns the CPU it's until it finishes or it yields the CPU voluntarily. So this design works well for the Ceph OST because all IOs are already sharded by placement groups, right, PGs. So a, a major uh, challenge, uh, you know, here is that the changes to the all of the changes that we're talking about here, uh, in terms of the non-blocking IO, user space scheduling, asynchronous threading, right? Th those are to the core part of the OST operation. So these changes need to be made without breaking existing functionality and retaining backward compatibility, right? So the other challenge is, uh, you know, the implementation of a low level uh, thread per core or a user space scheduling library with shared nothing architecture. So 
so we we kept, we kept we basically went looking for libraries or various frameworks that would support this out of the box or have a a larger community uh, behind them and c star happened to be one of the uh, asynchronous programming frameworks with all the ideal characteristics to meet all the set goals so c star is a uh, is an open source uh, project which implements a one thread per core shared networking architecture in a uh, in C++. Uh, it has a user space lockless new malware memory allocator. Uh, and per perhaps more, even more important, uh, because it's community backed, right, has a, has a, a strong roadmap. And it has been successfully proven uh, with integration into projects like Redis, Cassandra, Memcached, with uh, handsome, you know, scalability and performance improvements. Now, C star implements uh, the asynchronous I/O with futures, promises, and continuations as the building blocks. Uh, it also makes code easier to write and maintain by grouping logically connected asynchronous constructs together rather than plain callbacks, as with some other asynchronous frameworks. And to to further simplify the development, it also comes with uh, networking and storage stack. So essentially, for all these reasons, C star ended up being uh, the framework of choice uh, for, for, Ceph, uh, for the Ceph refactor. Now, where is Crimson at right after two releases? Um, so Crimson has been developed in the, in the mainline, the Ceph master branch, and uh, has been available uh, as, as an experimental uh, feature uh, over the last couple of releases. Uh, so as of uh, Ceph Reef release, Libredos operations, uh, including snapshot support are functional. Um, you know, the, the goal has been to get uh, RBD uh, as the first interface on top of Libredos working uh, on top of a memory-backed uh, memory backed object store called Science Store as well as uh, Blue Store uh, plugged into Crimson, which is now called Alien Store. And deployment of uh, Crimson over Ceph admin, Ceph ADM is supported. Again, uh, all of this is still he heavily work in progress and, uh, you know, but available for trials. Now, talking about the Ceph S release, uh, we, you know, the, we are working on Scrub, erasure coding, multi-shard support. Uh, the multi-shard support involves, uh, you know, handling basically multi multi-core use cases, um, and then you know which tie to performance, right? Initially into on, of RBD, uh, and then followed by uh, you know Redos Gateway and CFFS. Uh, but again, stabilization and multi-core supports are our priorities as we add. The, the other features as well. There's a new object store that is being designed natively for Crimson uh, with uh, with the C star architecture. Uh, it uh, it is designed to support uh, emerging storage technologies like the faster NVMe drives and zone namespaces uh, supported. Uh, you know, su supporting SSDs, and it is designed to scale better than Blue Store. Uh, primarily, you know, the chain, the big change is basically uh, the uh, the metadata store has been moved to a, uh, a, a custom uh, custom implementation, moving away from CPU heavy implementations like RocksDB. So C store is a is again a brand new feature, uh, experimental. Uh, release appeared first in in Reef, uh, release of Ceph. Um, still, uh, you know, still pretty preliminary, uh, right? We, we we have focused a lot on testing with uh, with Blue Store, uh, with Crimson, and C Store will be uh, more of an S release target, where will be where the focus is basically stability of the existing existing features. Uh, you know the Tautology, uh, unit testing, framework integration, uh, and then multi multi core run to completion support as well as snapshotting will come in this release. 
So looking at uh, the, the status, right? You know, where is the performance at, right? For, for Crimson Messenger. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so I'll actually, spl I've split this into sort of three, three different areas. There's a, uh, there's, you know, so this is a snapshot of looking at just the messenger. So the messenger was completely redone uh, for, uh, for Crimson uh, with the C star paradigm. And as you can see, uh, compared with the async messenger in the classic OST, if you look at the blue line, uh, the multi shard uh, Crimson messenger uh, actually scales very well with the with number of cores. So we wanted to make sure that each thread was working independently in the IO path with the, share, with the shared not, nothing lock light design, uh, which it appears to, to function as expected. And in terms of uh, scaling, we we also see you know uh, we basically did some tests about uh, you know let's say two CPUs with with hundred plus cores each uh, right we, we the perf pattern basically indicates that the the performance hotspots are essentially consistent across one core and hundred plus cores which which basically shows a good directional scaling trend now. Now, of course, all of these this data needs to be viewed in the context of the Crimson OSD paired with an object store. So, what does that look like? Let, let's look at that next. So, so when you put it all together, uh, Crimson uh, plus cr Crimson plus Blue Store, Crimson plus uh, Science Store, which is the memory back store, or Crimson plus C Store, compared with the classic Ceph OST is. Uh, is what the chart to the right shows. Again, mind you, this is a uh, single node, sing single OST, one replica result at the moment. We are just, we are working on doing larger tests, but uh, but in this limited uh, set of tests, the the reads show uh, very good scaling. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the 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 dark blue line is the Crimson Science Store, which is the memory backed OST, which shows very good read and and write scaling. Uh, and and when you when you compare that to the light blue, uh, which is the classic blue store, which is the today's Ceph, right? Which is the, that light blue line. Compared to that, the uh, the red, green, and blue lines for crimson seem to show uh, good directional scaling. So so the architecture uh, that we have put forth in in crimson, right, is it's, it's, it seems directionally correct, right? That's that's what these results indicate. And we'll we'll come come out come to you with you know additional data through some other blog posts and talks right so stay tuned for that. Now, so these are some of the crimson resources, and there are actually a few other uh, additional uh, talks and papers uh, linked off of the crimson landing page that you should review. Now. Crimson is a significant leap, uh, at least planned leap, leap forward for Ceph. Uh, it does unlock, or it aims to unlock the true potential of new generation of storage hardware uh, for those highly scalable and efficient storage solutions, right? Whether you're dealing with massive data sets in the data center use cases that Vincent covered, or the emerging AI ML uh, deployments, right? So we, we think Ceph will continue to offer a future-proof storage solution, and Crimson is a big part of that. So whether you're a seasoned Ceph user or just starting out your ideas and expertise on you know, how we can shape the future of Crimson and Ceph, uh, th those are definitely welcome. So uh, so please, please do continue to provide feedback on Crimson. Now, this talk cannot be complete without the mention of AI. <laughs> So, uh, so I wanted to uh, link a couple of a uh, couple of recent talks uh, from one from Phil Williams and another from Mark Nelson. Uh, Mark Nelson is actually doing a, a talk tomorrow, in fact, on uh, on the Ceph uh, one terabyte topic. But but Phil's talk, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, actually did a, did a give a great treatment on AS. You know, what does storage mean for AI? The economics of storage for AI, right? W what are the performance considerations? So, for instance, uh, let's say you know Phil does a great job of citing uh, the 
the NVIDIA H100, uh, the GPUs, and, and the super part requirements, which uh, take the IO challenge, right? You know, the storage requirements for, for the GPU challenge to another level, uh, you know, it's the spec basically talks about uh, IO requirements up to a terabyte per second. So, and then, you know, the self community is, is of course working on, uh, you know, working on addressing some of the, uh, some of the gaps in terms of the, the, the feature or corner cases like CFFS, uh, small file performance or uh, metadata scale, server scalability. Uh, but, uh, but at a minimum, you know, that terabyte per second, uh, scalability can be achieved with Ceph. There's a, there's a first proof point uh, that the community was able to put out there. So you're, uh, you are encouraged to review uh, these talks. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Vincent to close, uh, uh, talking about a couple of different IBM uh, use cases that, uh, that he's going to talk about. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Tushar. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we wouldn't conclude this presentation without talking about the AI use cases. That um, um, when we talk about AI, there are several aspects of that, right? So number one is AI. Uh, there are several aspects of uh, AI from, you know, the trainings to inferencing, the fine tunings, or even rack patterns. So when we talk about AI, First thing first is you need to make sure that you have the right amount of data and right quality of data to help you to have a productive trainings. And all this data, you know, IBM has a lot of uh, AI project, not just IBM, everybody in the industry has a lot of AI projects. And how do you, the first question people figure out is how do we store those data effectively and efficiently? And, uh, you know, until now, when people talk about the big data platform in the industry, people pretty much refer to the HDFS, the data lake, the traditional we call it data lake. Unfortunately, over time, the data lake become, you know, some kind of the the, the data junkyard, if you will. And uh, but now I think that if you look at that, you pay attention to the AI operations. You know, everybody's gravitating to this new lake house architecture. They're converging all this data into the new form of data lake, which is conversion of the data warehouse with the, with the data lake called the data lake house. And that is absolutely based on object storage. And Ceph play a very important role here to provide the backbone of the storage for the lake house. There's an object storage interface, especially having all the capabilities and uh, in the scalabilities and agilities of the object storage. You know, and if you can see the self object storage, go beyond that, right? Self object storage has a has a advanced capability to support it as a higher level database operation, such as you know S3 Select, you know Presto plugin, uh, uh, Parquet, Iceberg data format optimize Iceberg Iceberg data format optimizations. So allow people to be able to more efficiently processing their data. That is where we're talking about this. This is why you see the quote from IBM talking about Ceph is you know optimized for large and single multi-site deployments, and you know Ceph really is it's the it's the foundation for the underlying AI. Then I think to share talk about the next 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 angle of the of the of the AI storage is the performance, and I to share already talking about this right. You watch the, with the proper configurations, set provide the you know great performance for the AI operation, which is mostly a um, sort of large I/O transactions. And the last one I want to talk about is the data governance, right? Which is a very very important aspect of the AI. And once you have you, once you develop a model, even even raw data, how do you make sure the data is compliance and and all this you know the, is secure? And that's where I want to talk about the future of what investment from the from set perspectives that we are we we as a community is looking at that how do we you know how do we safeguard those uh, AI model to make sure that the data is is um, is um, it's 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 is you know against the the data theft is real and that is where our uh, I would like to see that you know community is it will be focusing on to allow people to be actually trust Ceph as their storage data store to 
harvest the raw data from that, as well as put their AI model, the crown jewel of the, uh, crown jewel of the enterprise in self uh, object storage. Okay, with that, I turn back to um, Aaron. Yep, thank you. And now we can open it up for Q&A. Uh, as a reminder, you can ask questions by selecting the ask question option and entering your question. And we do have a number of questions already. I just wanna reassure folks that if we don't make it to your question, we will try to answer those on the subsequent blog. But um, let's see, starting with some of these, uh, there's a question on whether or not uh, does Ceph provide shared storage similar to Gluster or something like EFS? Uh, yes, I mean, Ceph provide the, uh, the share, file, share file capability, which is like EFS. Okay. And there's another question here. I, so it talks about also where is it best? Many small files or large files? So I don't know if that also maybe speaks to use cases, but. <laughs> it, it, the thing is that it's always evolving. I mean, right now, um, I, I, when we say that, uh, what is the best? You know, actually, as far as I know, most of the file storage today, very few of them are really optimized for very, very tiny EDB file capabilities. And, but those things are evolving with all the new technology. Today, I would say we, very comfortable to handle the large files, but with the new um, new feature coming in in, in the coming releases, uh, th this is not a you know binary binary answer. This thing will be uh, go over time. Will will we'll continue to improve in terms of the granularity of the file support. Okay, and um, let's see, uh, how can hardware RAID coexist with Ceph? Yeah, today Ceph really doesn't have a. I mean, okay. The long story, long story, long uh, short answer to the long the, uh, the to the answer to the question is yes. Ceph can support uh, hardware array. Ceph today has the has the you can support you can you can choose the erasure coding across the um, uh, across multiple drives, or you can uh, you can choose to implement with the multiple replicas. And uh, uh, in either of the situation, either of the capability, in a way that is sort of transparent to the to the radial radial layers. I mean, we once we create the volumes, you know, volume is be, uh, has a ray adapt hardware ray behind it. You know, you know, it's it's some kind of transparent. So we do have those. We can support those uh, hardware ray adapters. Okay. And um, let's see here, we have, uh, can you use Ceph with two Active Directory domains? Let's say we have a path slash FS slash share. Can you create two SMB shares for this path, one per domain with a different set of permissions? I might have to get back to you on that with SMB, SMB specific answers. And uh, I, let, me, let me take it back to you on that to, to get the detail uh, where we are on that, okay? I mean, yeah, the, I think a lot of these questions might be this way. I know the intention is we want to support that. I mean, you know, we want to support the the enterprise and all the workloads, you know, from block and object and files. The intention is we want to support that. But for exactly where can we support it? I think it's better for me to get back to you with the exact when are we going to, um, do we support it or not? If not, when will we intend to support that? Yeah, I think we should be able okay. to. Okay. Yeah, that and some of these water. questions. Good detail and and one uh, yeah one one quick comment on the on the raid question um, you know uh, so so red uh, to just to add to Vincent's comment earlier right uh, so generally red is not recommended uh, for use under Ceph because it duplicates the durability functions at a block level right reducing capacity impacting performance so uh, so, so yeah, I mean it's 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 you you will. Uh, you, you'll not see it used uh, very often, but I mean, but I mean, can be can be done, but it's not recommended. Yeah, it's it's doable. I mean, we you can do it, and most of people either using the you know multiple uh, three way replications or they just use erasure codings, which is sort of another advantage. Is you sort of you know you can you can run any servers instead of hard coded to a hard testing but for particular rail adapters. Okay, um, so let's see. Uh, is it possible to geo replicate Ceph data store? Having a few exabytes in a single data center seems a bit scary. 
geo replicated in your store. Okay, uh, we have provide we have a capability to do the async replications, and we even uh, recently I know there is the engagements with uh, with uh, some client. They are talking about the three way replication of object storage. So we have a you know a synchronous replication and asynchronous replication available. A single uh, single replication, especially in the stretch cluster context that we are able to stretch. Again, it all depends on, I know, you know, you don't want to have all your egg in one basket. And uh, the common implementation using stretch clusters, spread your data across multiple data center. That's a very common practice. I see that that is very, uh, as today, I even see people are trying to do stretch cluster across multiple, more than two data centers, three data center, if you will. Um, but stretch cluster in general are shorter distance. You know, I, I don't see people stretch cluster, stretch cluster go beyond like 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers. That's, you know, the turnaround time may be too long. For those long distance across geo replications, I see people doing the, the, the asynchronous replication between different self clusters. Okay. And there's a question here, was SPVDK considered for low level locking? SPVDK? SPDK? Consider low level locking? Uh, okay, I, yes. Tushar, can you answer the question? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can take that one. Uh, yeah, so certainly when <clears throat> when we're looking at, uh, so it, so I, I've been part of the SPDK team at Intel for, uh, you know, since inception. And uh, yeah, so SPDK has been under consideration. It, it, you know, SPDK uh, provides user, user more drivers uh, as well as a, you know, user space uh, programming framework derived from DPDK. Uh, however, uh, C star was a uh, turned out to be a you know better alternative for for just the shared nothing you know the threading library piece of it uh, because it was already in C plus plus and uh, it, it it integrated allowed allowed us the 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 flexibility to uh, to use a DPDK or kernel based network stack and. On the storage side, it does allow us to mm -hmm. to use I/O Uring uh, via the kernel or use SPDK, right? So, so we'll so the plan is, you know, we're talking to the C Star community uh, to see how SPDK could be, uh, you know, could could be leveraged in Crimson, uh, but but it'll be mainly for the lower level, uh, you know, disk access, right? Uh, at this point, um, so the a lot of the goodness that SPDK provides, right? Uh, AC Star was basically built on the same principles, and uh, that's you know. So hopefully that answers the question. SPDK will be used on the storage portion of Crimson underneath C Store. Thanks, Tushar. Another question here: What type of storage is sitting behind the OSD design? VMware SAN. Uh, so, so the assumption here is uh, that it is you know every OSD um, is uh, you know is, I mean, traditionally it is mapped to one one disk, right? Uh, it it could be a virtual disk, but it's it's typically a physical disk. Uh, so, so to think of a uh, you know disks, a bunch of NVMe disks in a in a, in a physical server with one one OSD uh, handling you know one one disk uh, and and it could be uh, you know it could be namespaces right uh, that you know let's say zns type drives that would allow us to do physical uh, partitioning based on the type of media uh, as you know expose the disk as partitions then it could be one ost to a partition so it's it's not uh, you know, VMware type of storage. This is a so Ceph basically provides equivalent functionality to let's say a vSAN essentially, right? So, uh, so Ceph each Ceph OSD manages a physical drive or a subset of a drive. Thanks. Um, another question: Is there any kind of support for parallel I/O on Ceph? The answer is yes. <laughs> what, what do you mean by parallel I/O? I mean, yeah, correct. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, if the person who asked that question could maybe try to clarify, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, more detail. 
Okay. Well, here's another. Is there any NVMe over HDD percentage to have the best throughput? I'm not sure I quite get the questions. Um, can you repeat it again? I'm sorry. Yeah, is there any NVMe over uh, HDD percentage to have the best throughput? Percentage of what? Yeah, so maybe someone who uh, asked that could perhaps clarify that through the chat. Yeah, but in, in general, um, uh, you know, the I mean, we we actually have uh, the community, right? And through the SEV documentation has uh, a number of best known the principles and you know architecture guidelines right documented for let's say a cpu to a hard drive ratio or a cpu to nvme ratio uh, right so uh, we can we can cover that when we uh, answer some of the remaining questions in the blog so we can cover this one so but uh, whoever asked the question if you could clarify if if that is what you me meant you know the core to hard drive ratio or as in is, is it the cpu to disk ratio for hdd versus nvme that you're asking about, um, then we can certainly answer that question. So I want to do a, can I do a plug here? So the SEF community is uh, launching uh, user councils. They try to gather the, the best practice from the, from, the, from the user populations. So it just get launched a few weeks ago. Um, there are two topics right now they are focusing on. One is the performance that will answer this kind of question that what is the best practice? The second one uh, to achieve the best performance. The second one is um, uh, consumabilities. You know, well, how do you on day one, day two operation? So if you are a user of Ceph, I uh, strongly recommend you to uh, uh, to join the Ceph uh, community and then participate in the, the user council um, discussions. Yeah, and so the person who asked the question clarified that they meant NVMe percentage capacity. Okay. But no, I don't know if that clarified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand. There really is no no hard rule here because that you know I, I'm I'm not trying to answer the question with good more questions because it depends on what kind of CPU we have and things like this. Today, what I see very often, the people implement either all flash uh, NVMe's or or HDD. I actually don't see a lot of um, um, uh, the hybrid one. I mean, Toshio, I don't know what's your experience. Right now, I see that uh, you know we have we I've seen I have seen several customers that several users that they implement all flash, uh, even object storage or block storage to get a consistent performance, and the other one that you using the HDD for the sort of high capacity object storage uh, data repository. Yeah, I, I agree. I okay. think that's that's what we we have seen also. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. And here's a here's a question. Uh, saw you have support for NVMe over TCP. Any plans for adding NVMe over fiber channel support? From a community perspective, I don't see. There, I don't. I'm not aware of any activity going on to do the NVMe over over fiber channel today. Um, how about, uh, does Ceph provide a good user interface to monitor usage, performance, and other details in case it is used as an object as a service across multiple tenants? Uh, today, I think that that, that's, that come with the, under the consumabilities, and I see there are a lot of uh, people contributed to the uh, community in this area. So uh, I think that this technology will, you, you will start seeing more and more of those capabilities in terms of managing tool to get a better uh, profile of, of the utilization efficiencies, uh, uh, multi-tenancy, QoS, you're gonna see those things. You know, the, the more that Ceph get into become the substrate for the cloud native on-prem storage, the more this kind, of, this kind of technology will show up in the communities. Yeah, and, it, uh, okay. and the Ceph dashboard, I mean, has come a long way, right? At, at you know the the administration the dashboard monitoring tools come a long way, and uh, and maybe we can uh, you know mark this question to cover in detail in the in like when we write the you know blog format answers. Yep. 
because uh, this will be this is actually a very important question, right? The usability and the uh, observability. Uh, so it, it'll be good to provide some detail for those that are interested. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and maybe one more question, since I think uh, we will have to save a lot of these questions for the blog, and I want to give folks a little bit time back before their next uh, meetings. Uh, how about um, what about fault tolerance? If we have 124th of nodes offline, how possible is data loss? Uh, how can the cluster avoid request to down nodes? Um, first of all, this depends on your configuration, right? Let's say that you have uh, three web replications. Once you start to lose the critical mass, that self will go into the read-only mode, so will not, will not allow you to, I think that's the design principle of self is to make sure that we don't lose data. So before you even get there, SEF will stop the pro stop the right operation to uh, to to make sure that you don't you don't update the the current state until until you recover it. So I am again there are two questions for this one, which is very 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 good top very good topic for us to drill 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 down. One is the data loss. I think that I'm less worried about this. You know, SEF has a reputation in the market that has a very very um, uh, uh, a very conservative approach to protect the data. So as I say that once we approaching the, the critical mass, we start to stop the right to the, the systems. In terms of availability, again, it, it's the go by how did you configure it? We have people that, you know, spread it, you know, have a like six copy of data across like three data centers. Then you need to, in order to lose the assets, now we are talking about you need to lose, you may lose the whole site and then you lose it, you know, multiple drive and you still, uh, you still be able to, you know, the data is still available. It really depends on what's your, what's your protection designs for that. Okay. All right. And I wasn't sure if too sure you wanted to add anything, but um, I think we can, uh, you know, close this out. Uh, I, I thank you for viewing this webinar. Um, you can also rate this presentation. It's important as it gives us a solid indication of whether we're delivering the right quality of content. Where a score means one, you would have rather spent the time more wisely. A score five means it was perfect for you. And thank you to Shar and Vinta, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Thank you.